Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Dr. Fabian Theis, uh, who's uh, Director of the Institute of Computational Biology here at Helmholtz Munich, uh, as well as uh, Technical University of Munich. Um, so, um, recently awarded the, the Leibniz Prize, the highest, most prestigious award in Germany, so congratulations for that. Um, over to you uh, to talk about uh, a range of challenges and your own research and examples. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming to Helmholtz. Welcome again also from, from my side. I, I lead the computationally health department, sort of the computer science faculty here at, at, at Helmholtz. And I sort of show you a little bit what we've been uh, doing there and a few examples. So just to gauge the background, who, who's from more computer science? So, so any life science bio people in there as well? <laughs> okay, so a little bit. So, so I, I try, try to keep it lightweight, but obviously there's going to be you know, our, our core focus is to contextualize machine learning to, um, yeah, well, biomedical examples. So I try to keep it lively, but if you have questions, really just interrupt me in between. I, I think uh, we should have time for that. So let me just get started. Um, I wanted to tell you sort of a, 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 a little bit about challenges that we have. Does anyone know this thing? That typically works with the computer scientists, less with the biomedical people. <laughs> so yeah, th this is you know Star Trek, right? So uh, this this what's called tricorder, where it was a guy Leonard Mc McCoy, maybe right? Nim Nimroy, Nimoy, Nimoy. Thank you, sir. Yeah, the doctor's McCoy, right? Yeah. So, so in any case, so he scans people, right, and, and sort of not only directly knows what they have, but he can also then directly sort of administer the right type of treatment. And that's sort of a bit of a, of, of a, a, a pipe dream that I think we could try to go for with many of, of, of the recent advances in biotechnology. Sort of, you know, having a diagnosis as well as a sort of a, a treatment that directly predicted. And I think this is something where, you know, we will be able to, to go for. And, you know, we have all kinds of essays, machines, that we can now quantify state of a whole organism of particular organs. The things that we look at into is at the moment something called single cell genomics that really gives us access to, you know, where disease happens, which is on the cellular level. Once we have that, you know, we can try to predict, for example, effect of drugs, things like that. And this is where we use AI and this sort of our core expertise bringing these type of information together. So I think we could reach that, that type of future. And actually, I recently got an, an ESC grant, an ESC advanced grant to do these things. I sort of say a little bit about that later. Essentially, it's, a, it's also one of these deep generative models that you have been surely hearing so much in, in recent times. So, so we do AI, and you know, I don't need to tell this, this to you much, but obviously AI, you know, we want to imitate intelligent behavior. It's, it's an old thing, has been around since the late 40s. And what we want to do is actually, so if we, we use machine learning, so this contextualization of AI, particularly deep learning for these NVIDIA colleagues still around? Thanks for that. We give a lot of money to you guys. <laughs> like really a lot. Uh, I didn't want to do even more, but we can't sort of house all of this because like, <laughs> but, you know, we're going to get there. Um, so I'm, I'm sure, sure all of you are aware of this. This is this maybe not so much. Anyone heard about foundation models so far? Right. So, thanks, Tianjin. So, so this is sort of one of the new terms that people push a bit at the moment, which is maybe a sort of a bit overselling. But I think it's also, I mean, let's let's be honest. Deep learning has been around since the, I, I well, well, to be honest, actually, sort of since since around here when people spoke about uh, new networks, this has been sort of recoined here. But what foundation model is is this idea that we pre-train a really big model and then just contextualize the applications afterwards. Sort of, it exhibits this sort of reuse in, in many aspects and obviously large language models are the example but there's many of these things and you know for all of these we need really big data and um, I, I can i'm happy to discuss about, about this a bit more but i mean all of these applications such as you know text uh, a speech to text or image detection you know this is stuff that was really really hard for the past 50 years but only sort of last decade all of these things have been solved by learning those filters those representation of these data in an automated fashion that's sort of the key trick right that we, we sort of learn all these early representations well and we can do things on top of them. Sure, language, I think all of you know, you know in, in, in Biomed, uh, AlphaFold, what, what you might have heard about prediction from protein structure from sequence has been one of the big things uh, uh, last year that has been sort of really uh, uh, being leaped uh, uh, to advance. And you know, all of this is based on data. And this is something that we, that we have here in the Helmholtz Association General. Helmholtz, I think, uh, Alf, you gave an introduction, but largest research organization in Europe. 
um, a, a, a lot of really strong research centers, very strong health branch, DKFZ, MDC, and also Hamas Munich, part of this. And uh, we have all this data is being generated. In my context, sort of in the biomedical context, you somewhat roughly can be classified into genomics, omics, sort of molecular type of readouts, image-based readouts, let it be on the um, sort, of, sort of microscopy side. There's people from Zeiss here, right? Thanks. Uh, good stuff. <laughs> uh, we complement this a lot with 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 sequencing based imaging as well. You know where you can sort of do something like in situ and sort of localize particular uh, transcripts, and uh, then of course the complex phenotyping. So something that I think we in Germany are not as good as as we could, but you know sort of building these large records of phenotypic description of of people, patient databases that you know works in hospitals, but bridging hospitals is a challenge and. We, as well as many others, try to contribute to that. I don't know if you heard about the Medicine Informatic Initiative, all these medical informatics type of stuff. But if we have access to large cohorts of patient variation also on a phenotypic level, you can start building more interesting models. So what we do, and this is this computational health center that we've, we've set up, where we have something like 300 scientists now working on that. So we're the largest place for doing this type of computational research in biomedicine in Central Europe. Where we aim to develop computational tools powered by AI to accelerate this current translation. Yeah, that's sort of our mission. I, I think rather clear. Let me show you sort of a, a little bit who we are. So we focus on sort of more general health AI, and I just show you the PI. So each of, of these has sort of a lapse between sort of five to twenty people, or something like that. And I think you will hear later uh, hear the Tin Ying talking about. I think you will talk later, right? Um, light sheet microscopy analysis and, 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 and related things, I think quite exciting. But then we also focus sort of on the more sort of input processing side of things, you know, where we do digital genomics, image processing and so on. And obviously all of this is fluent, you know, everyone is using machine learning in one way or the other. And then we focus also a bit more on, on the sort of more mechanistic side of things. And I think that's a really interesting aspect. You know, we have these deep learning models where we can sort of approximate, predict very powerful, very many things. But in the end, let's say we had the whole world sequenced and have DNA of everyone, we would still not be able to really predict, like have a, the GVAS that explains everything because in the end it's N equals one. Combinatorics is so high that we need to constrain it with more prior information to make it work. So why did AlphaFold work? Well, it worked because it contextualized this. this. Why, why is, is uh, what sort of attention-based mechanisms working so well for sequence data? Well, because you made them work for, so you need to sort of, you can't build fully connected networks that are stupid, but you need to do, um, make it a bit more specific. This is what we do. Just some, some key numbers of, of, of the center. So we publish well, we have a lot of um, grants and a lot of also industry interactions. This is something that we're very, very proud of. We have a whole industry track in our PhD program, for example, and we work very intensely uh, with, with collaboration partners. Essentially, most of the farmers basically talk to us in the last two years for one way or another because of, of the big ones because there's there's a bunch of tools coming out that i think working working really well and we got a, a, a bunch of these ear secrets that you might have heard about this is sort of the academic performance measure if you got one of these you know so you go to the next career stage all right and and and, and topics is around um sort of algorithms um, modeling and digital genomics so let me show you uh in sort of 10 minutes max um five minutes maybe uh a little bit more what we do. So the question is, cells make decisions. And you know, this trajectory learning is something that I've been putting a lot, lot of time into. But you know, sometimes you know, ideally we want to keep them there, but then they sort of take wrong decisions and then they go into all of these diseases. And because we have so many samples, we can actually reconstruct these trajectories. This is sort of a key point. If you have many observations, you can see what on average a cell would go through and potentially sort of branch off into a disease kind of state. And if we understand this branching off, maybe we can even learn what makes it branch off. So maybe we can not just do an association, but even a causal underlying model that tells us which, uh, what is driving this, this issue. And this is, uh, these are all really fun and, and I think quite deep questions in machine learning that we can, can sort of ask to, to the system. Um, so this is what my lab does. We've been putting a lot of time into learning trajectories and, and sort of finding these similarities. But we've been also um, doing then integration across many data sets, basically learning atlases, and I'll show you in a minute what that means. Really fun machine learning problem, very useful, I think, for the future. But then we've been also adding spatial context a lot to that. So uh, combining this either with microscopy, potentially also in a multi-scale fashion to larger organisms, and we have all kinds of applications with partners. So 
just to show you one example, in this case, you're looking at a, a data set that was done here actually on campus from Heiko Lickert in uh, a murine gut, where you see a bunch of cells in 20,000 dimensions transcripts measured but projected to three dimensions. You see, this is not all over. This is sort of localized. So the cells don't sort of occupy everything, but they cluster into particular regions. So this set of cells, for example, it would be intestinal stem cells that we in our, we in our gut sort of have to reproduce that, that sort of epithelial la la layer all the time. Otherwise, you know, the gut would not be working very well. And, you know, for example, it makes these enteroendocrine cells. And what you see is that those things were actually connected to the original cluster when we flew through, right? There were these sort of progenitor cells that turned them into that. So what we essentially do, and obviously we don't do this in three dimensions, but in high dimensions, essentially we measure for each cell something like a transcriptional state or so. And then we, we look for these trajectories. So we, for example, do some type of random walk approaches or something more directed. But essentially we estimate what these trajectories would be. So it's an unsupervised challenge, not just clustering, but connecting sort of transitions between clusters. You know, once we can do this, we can also do this in a spatial setting. So we're about to bring out a method that tells you, for example, in a developing embryo, where in this case, I think, think heart would sort of localize to, to new points. So we can align the samples al along sort of these, these, these complex trajectories. But we can also do this for people. So in this case here, for example, each of these dots would be a human patient, an eye of a patient from an OCT in different stages of a disease called diabetic retinopathy, major cause for, for blindness in the adult very common uh, machine learning data that people looked at. And you sort of see them here transitioning from healthy, mild, medium, severe. You know, we didn't tell the method to do that, but automatically found this in that latent space representation of the uh, convolution neural network that we used for that. All right, so we want to build these atlases. Now we have this, this cellular information, we want to put it together. And one of these biggest initiatives, I think in the field is called the Human Cell Atlas. What it does is it brings me together people from all around the world. I'm in the organizing committee of this thing now. And what we try to do is build this you know, kind of system, periodic system, not of elements, but of cell types. We want to sort of give you enumeration. Like as always, when there's a new technique coming along, you know, what do you do first? You just categorize things. That's kind of what we want to do. So we want to basically take cells from all the different organs. You want to say, hey, what's the variation there? If you have that, you have a control, and then you can map the on top of that. My lab, for example, has been putting a lot of time into gut, into gut, pancreas, but also lung. And for lung, we've been doing a, a bunch of things, both for mouse and human. And the most recent one is about to come out in Nature Medicine. I think we got the cover for that as well. So please watch out. Please read it. <laughs> and it has been really big international effort to put a lot of data sets together. And I'll tell you in a minute what the machine learning aspect of that is. But once we have this, you know, we can ask questions. For example, we could ask when SARS-CoV-2 came out, where are entry genes for this particular virus in the various cells? You know, where would it be able to even just talk? And then we found, for example, that it's in a bunch, of, it's, it's kind of all over the body, but for example, in, in more in some regions in the brain that are associated to, 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 to smell. And interestingly, in the lung, in obviously a, a lot there. And then because we had many replicates across also human variation, we could see that this was enriched in older men that smoke or something like that. So you can ask these metadata questions on top of that as well. Yeah, and we're doing this now with HCA for all kinds of uh, additional uh, atlases. So what's the machine learning challenge so for the computational people, right? I mean, what, what are the actual tasks there? So I, 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 I took this, this, this metaphor from, from a guy from Reddit, like something like 10 years ago, who went across campus and asked people to draw the world. And then, you know, he did this a few times, and he got always different pictures. I think that's sort of what I guess I, I would do. So the challenge is, if you now get these atlases or these particular data sets from different labs, they all look different. I don't know if you ever tried some image-based integration. I think it's very hard. Even though you make the same instrument, more or less, I guess, maybe not. But then you give it to different technicians. There's always a variation there. And maybe even across days or, you know, fluorescent staining, things like that. Very similar here. So what we want to do, we want to integrate it. What he did, he just sort of overlapped things. And it kind of looks a bit better, right? So, for example, some people forgot Australia, you know, on average. Wisdom of the crowds, they, they put it there. And this is kind of what we want to do as well. So we have our cells and the cell types, but if we have it for different labs just all over the place, so we need to do something to sort of non-linear align and integrate. This is what we call data integration, something what we do for samples. And this is sort of roughly how it works. So we use something called autoencoders, so unsupervised neural networks. And I'm sure many of you have seen this. It's a very old concept. 
it's sort of a nonlinear generalization of PCA uh, for, for those who are interested in that. Essentially, you feed in a, a gene time cell matrix on this side here, you squeeze it down, you blow it up again, and because we don't have any supervised challenge, okay, we, we want to do unsupervised, you know, this, this new fancy thing, we do everything unsupervised. So we make the output as similar as possible to the input. So we reconstruct the data. That's the only challenge that we give to it. Later, you can ask additional things. And if you do that, because it needs to be squeezed through that bottleneck, it sort of needs to clean up the data, and thereby it sort of finds better filters. There's other ways how to do it, but this is sort of the most standard thing that we do. And now, because I said I want to remove batch effects, we tell the method here about the batch, but it should sort of not use that batch information in here to reconstruct. So that's why it removes this information. Well, and then sort of finds these transitions. For example, here, sort of you see already at the transitional process, you can actually do this in real data and, and, sh and show that this works and add some prior. And the key point I wanted to make here is like in many fields, there's still very traditional standard methods that are being used based on linear methods and so on. And in our feed, we just see also this transition that computer vision has been undergone something like 10 years ago, where everyone nowadays uses deep learning, right? In medical statistics, not everyone is using deep learning. Computer vision, sure, right? But like on health records, no, but this will come. And similar for, for us, we ran two competitions at, at NeurIPS, largest machine learning conference, with, I think, first one, 300 people, second one, 1,500 people participating, and those new network methods outperformed big data sets, many of these traditional ones. So that's why there's been a big interest in, in, in that ever since, and my lab has been, I guess, pioneering some, 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 some of these approaches. So in the last fi five minutes, five minutes if, if, if I may, Paul, I, I wanted to show you one more thing about generative neural networks, right? You've all heard about generative unsupervised models being the thing, right? We want to generate images from text. We want to where I generate text from text, that's essentially chat models and so on. This is an old example from computer vision. Computer vision has been often dealing with images of, of, of people because that's a nice sort of exemplary data set where we see what's going on. So here we have images of men with glasses and a representation in the latent space of that. And what you can now do in latent space, subtract images of men without glasses and add women without glasses. And lo and behold, you generate images of women with glasses. So you can sort of do latent space arithmetic that then, then sort of does this thing. And this does not work in, in original pixel space. So this is something that people have been finding. And, and you know, the reason why this works is because in this autoencoder latent space, so this was this bottleneck layer that I showed you before, and this one sort of in order to optimally compress the data, it needs to learn something about how faces look like in general. So it sort of normalizes eye to nose ratio, whatever. That's why you can compress it more efficiently. That's why you, know, you can sort of do additions in latent space, not in real space. And that's what we want to do as well. We kind of want to put cells on like glass on cells, that's my super funny joke. <laughs> but what we essentially want to do, we want to understand how cells behave under perturbations, okay? So for example, we have here drug perturbation, and this was what I said at the beginning with this, um, with, with this uh, tricorder type of machine, and we want to predict how this cell would behave, or how this new cell would behave under drug perturbation, which we haven't measured, by looking how another cell behaves under that. And this is sort of this rough concept that we've been pushing ever since, and we have a bunch of examples how we can generalize it also across species and so on. And here's just one of the models that we did. This is a collaboration with, with Meta AI. It's just about to come out now. Um, where we basically take this autoencoder as before, but now learn a dictionary at the same time, which will be the effect of the particular drug. And uh, we have an adversarial loss here that sort of removes this information about the perturbation between. Happy to, to discuss about the details later, but the key thing is, with this, we cannot predict now novel unseen conditions. We can sort of have drug response models in there, and we can also understand a bit more where these perturbations come from. And just one point I want to make, we do this for transcript home data, but we can do this very similar thing also for image-based data. There, the approach is a bit different. Maybe interesting for you, Tining. This is sort of a bit more based on, on a GAN type of architecture. Alessandro is using this. Maybe fun to, to connect if, if you're sort of interested in this style transfer type of things. But I think for microscopy, this is going to be, in my opinion, one of the future things that, you know, if you want to do a screen, you just can't do only so many cells. So you want to augment that with a computational model to drive your experimental design to then say, hey, you know, I have 100 cell lines that I want to try whatever type of high throughput experiment. Just pick these few because my model is most unsure about these ones and it sort of you feed it in again. So we can couple this to experimental design. So I have, I have a bunch of, 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 of sort of structured outlooks. I won't go in, in details through all of this. Maybe just stay with this one. So if you're interested in building models, and for example, um, 
Yeah, so if you're interested in mobs, you basically add information. This is sort of the whole big thing that the community does at the moment. We take sort of our underlying simple architecture and then we sort of add constraints. For images, we add that this is translation invariant. For, for 3D structures, we make a group invariant. For text, we sort of make it recurrent, things like that. So we add attention. And this is, I think, a concept that we can use to combine with our more principle-based models. You know, in engineering, when you build a car, you don't make a database analysis of whatever older cars you have around to build your new car, but you have a sort of a real forward model. You have some finite element design type of detailed model. I don't know if you build, if you build graphics cards. I don't know if, if, if you do that yourself, but I guess you have first sort of a simpler model that tells you, you know, this thing, how, how it should work when I, when I print it on silicon. This is not how biology works, but we don't have up in issue models. We have a few for particular pathways, but we need to combine. And this is sort of an idea how this would work. And we have some examples how this works. It's the paper coming out in Asian Methods with, with, with Yosef Lab, where we do something about RNA dynamics, something for spatial data, so for microscopy data, where you have uh, cell interactions modeled. And uh, your recent paper from, from Eric Topol and his team uh, coming out in Nature about foundation models, if you haven't seen this, I think, Tining, I put it in the PI chat. I think it's really cool uh, sort of general vision to do this also across scales. All right. So I, ha I have a, f a, f a, f a few more points about the drug perturbations, but I think I'm going to skip this also about spatial transcriptomics. The last point I just want to make, you know, if, if these things work, you know, we can do these trajectories not only for cells, but we can also, sorry, this is about, uh, so we, we can also do this sort of for learning transitions across subjects. This old idea of precision medicine, I'm sure you might have heard about this, you know, give every patient the right drug at the right time. Well, we're all different, right? So we're all getting like the same pill for whenever you have a headache. If you, I don't take this one, it's kind of, kind of a bit naive, right? So there has to be something better. And the idea is, you know, if we have similarities across all of us, with particular sort of subtypes, we can sort of develop risk scores, do things like that. And we have a few examples for this. So last point, we have been, in order to do this type of research, well, if you want to be world class, you first have to have critical mass. So we've been really putting a lot of effort into hiring uh, strong PIs across many sites. I'm working on this slide to make it a bit nice. It's a bit too many abbreviations. Sorry for that. There's one point we have all of these local German health centers that have spread all over Germany. They all have a local hub here in, in Munich. And from my computational health department, there's always at least one of them involved. So we're very active in sort of reaching out with experimental partners. But then we, we have a strong industry. Obviously, we collaborate a lot. We have a lot of research and education. We have uh, two of the best universities. Uh, well, TUM is actually the best university of European Union, as you might have heard in recent rankings. Very proud of that. It's a bit cheating because European Union, you know, doesn't have UK and Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the best, you know. That's how things go. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, we have obviously very strong compute uh, situated around, um, and particularly yeah, LZ sort of being one of, of the local supercomputers. And of, co of course, we also build, 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 build our, our own, right? I've, and to get it up and, and, and running and active again. And yeah, very happy how this works. So in the end, to be successful in this, you know, we have good questions. We have good experimental partners, but in the end, it's all about people. In order to get the people for that, I'm sure you must, you must see this in your companies as well. You know, you really have to make an effort to get the best people over. And for us, traditionally in, in Germany, it's often that it's not as diverse as it could be. So we want to have the best people internationally. So this diversity is really important. And so we've been building up across sort of the whole pipeline of how to get people. We've been putting up efforts to do so. And for example, this Munich School for Data Science is a school that I set up something like five or six year, years ago, where we really now have a very strong industry track, where we have sort of standardized ways how to work with industry. So thinking about a startup track as well, but the industry senior one is working well. So if you have some science projects that you want to bring in, I think this would be a very easy way um, to, to, to get started. Yeah, this is my lab. I think I showed already the, the, the department. And thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've probably got a few minutes for questions if anyone has any. I'm sure there's going to be some in the room. Uh, do we have anything? Because if not, I've, Alf and I were talking last night about challenges of sharing data yeah. between different institutions. Yeah. Um, is it a federated learning thing? Is it a central thing and the rest of it? But I think you've got, got some perspective on that. And, yeah. uh, I, 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 I skipped that slide. So uh, Joachim Schulze, he just contributed a little bit, had a, a nature paper recently about sort of a more fancy version of federated learning. He called swarm learning, and you know, we did some analysis with him on that. And, and you know, he even got cover for that in nature. You know, that's sort of as big as you can get science-wise, right? And 
I think federation is very tempting because you know essentially it tells you you don't need to change much of your infrastructure. That's why like particular clinics love that. Practice, hmm, not entirely sold on that. So we have API working uh, on, on, on this. Uh, Shadi Abakuni is now also a professor in Bonn, actually transitioning there. And most of the examples are, are on toy, and particularly you know, in Germany with all our, in many cases, imagine data security rules. People are very hesitant to do this. We have, we have the head of the German, Eth German Ethics Council, Alina Büchs, here in Munich. Actually, I have a few. I have a collaboration project with her to do sort of embed ethics, and she's very adamant about the fact that for research purposes, we can actually have very easy GDPR compliant ways of actually also having data combined in one place. So these GDPR requirements are not as as tough as it's often thought. But you know, we Germans tend to be on the always over careful side, obviously. So I'm very, very hopeful. I think for big analysis, we need to have things on. At, at one place, at least to be fast. You know, if, if I want to do GPU compute in a federated fashion, pff, I don't even want to get started on that. I, I, I spent, like, I cannot build a really big model in a super distributed fashion. Well, maybe you come up with, with some ways to do it, but it's going to be a bit of a crux. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful that we have a lot of also local compute that complements that. I think for then sort of running models and for evaluating models in a distributed fashion, that's fine. But if you really want to train and, and build them, I think you need to do more. We're setting up a Bavarian health cloud to potentially support that. There's some effort coming in this direction. Um, we are essentially looking what's the best breed in the world for these things. And I think for really sort of aggregated big uh, health databases, UK Biobank is, I guess, the, the, the biggest and, and brightest example uh, there. I have a co-affiliation to, to Sanger UK, and we work with them on, on some of these aspects. And I think it's... This is really cool, and you know, this is maybe a way how how to how to run these things, and that's where we we can can take some examples from. Good. The other aspect that we have been talking about actually was a, a lot of people in in AI think yeah, add more data, more data, repeat the experiments, do more on the rest of it. But I, but I think there's an interesting case for trying to build models that work with smaller data sets mm. to get to get meaningful results with the smallest possible data set. Yeah, I like more data. Very explicitly. We always think. <laughs> And and there has been always a say, yeah, but you know what? If the data is really bad and garbage, and garbage, yeah, I think this is type. This thing is over. So yeah, sure, just throw throw it at the model. We can deal with that. Um, but I agree. So I think there's there's two aspects. One is you want to have really computationally efficient models for some of sort of appliances where you actually want to want to implement this. For example, sometimes you really do have a a real time type of task that you want to do. I'm not just talking about all of sort of self driving cars, but you know also in in these settings. You want to sort of support the user in the analysis workflows in a real-time fashion and so on. For this, you need to have efficient models. So I think that, 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 that's one aspect. The second aspect, I think in medicine, also in biology, we will always have to some extent, we will always be to some extent in a low data regime if it comes to particular conditions. Because, you know, I mean, if we look at our variation, I mean, we are all obviously unique, similar, my, all of my cells are unique and so on, right? I mean, it's just combinatory, this is how things go. Um, I would now, so traditionally statistics that has been dealing with this high dimensional data, this is called small n large p statistics. So, you know, you had always few samples, high number of parameters, and then you've been sort of yeah. tailoring all these things. And it was everything linear and so on. I think we are past that. So we, we want to stick to the nonlinear latent space and embeddings type of things. So I wouldn't particularly push for that, but we need to be able to at least sort of have big pre-trained models that then don't need much training then can work in a sparse regime. That's why I think this foundation model idea is so nice, so that we really have particular features that are sort of built on very large cohorts that we can then take for our smaller, let's say, German ones, once been training on sort of UK or whatever, then uh, and, and, and use for this. Obviously, you bring in bias with all of these things, so there's a whole ethics True. discussion. True. Okay. Okay, good. Um, any last questions from the team? No? I, think we're, I think we're good. Listen, thank you so much. Thank you for your time today. Thanks um, for having me. Good.